Good afternoon everyone, welcome to the stream. Today we're going to continue with our normal Wednesday Poetry, Prose and Riddles stream. So, starting with the poetry. The last poem we read, that is last week, was Song from Prometheus, sorry, Prometheus Unbound by Percy Bysshe Shelley. As usual, we'll begin by rereading that last poem fairly quickly without much analysis because that's what we had done last week. And then we will move on to other poems that we haven't looked at yet. I think I will, however, take slightly longer to have a look through uh, Percy Shelley's history on Wikipedia. Usually we do that when we read the first poem by a particular author in the anthology but from what I recall last week we did look at it but we skipped over it quite quickly so I, after having read Song from Prometheus Unbound for the final time I will have a slightly longer look at his history and then we will move on to the subsequent poems so with that said let's get on with it So. Song from Prometheus Unbound 
On a poet's lips I slept, dreaming like a love adept, and the sound his breathing kept. Nor seeks nor finds he mortal blisses, but feeds on the aerial kisses of shapes that haunt thought's wildernesses. He will watch from dawn to gloom, the lake reflected sun illume, the yellow bees in the ivy bloom, nor heed nor see what things they be, but from these create he can, forms more real than living man, nurslings of immortality. One of these awakened me, and I sped to succour thee. Quite a beautiful little poem about the uh, the world the poet inhabit inhibits, or uh, perhaps illustrates with the uh, equally valid way of expressing it. Anyway. That's what we were looking at last week. So let's have a slightly longer look through uh, Percy Shelley's history. Uh, and then we will move on to Ode to the West Wind. Life and Education. Shelley was born on the 4th of August 1792 at Field Place, Warnham, West Sussex, England. He was the eldest son of Sir Timothy Shelley a Whig member of Parliament for, Ho for Horsham from 1719 to 1992 and for Shoreham between 1806 and 1812 uh, and his wife Elizabeth Pilfold, the daughter of a successful butcher. Uh, so she died in 1846, that's later than him, yes, by, by over 20 years. I know he died young. Oh, and his father. They both uh, outlived him. He had four younger sisters and one much younger brother. Shelley's early childhood was sheltered and mostly happy. He was particularly close to his sisters and his mother who encouraged him to hunt fish and ride. I know that hunting and fishing would have been seen very much as male activities at the time, whereas riding I think was an activity that both genders would participate in, though I wonder if competitive riding or was a, a distinctly male thing, that is as a sport, and if so if uh, that's what they're getting at here as opposed to just being able to ride because of course back in those days horses would have been one of the main forms of transportation so lots of people would have been able to ride anyway at age six he was sent to a day school run by the vicar of warnham church where he displayed an impressive memory and gift for languages in 1802 he entered the Sion House Academy of Brentford, Middlesex, where his cousin Thomas Medwin was a, was a pupil. Shady was bullied and unhappy at the school and sometimes responded with violent rage. He also began suffering from the nightmares, hallucinations and sleepwalking that would periodically afflict him throughout his life. Oh dear. Shelley developed an interest in science which su supplemented his voracious reading of tales of mystery, romance and the supernatural. During his holidays at Field Place, his sisters were often terrified of being subjected to his experiments with gunpowder, acids, and electricity. Goodness. Back at school, he blew up a paling fence with gunpowder. Uh, I wonder precisely what that is. That does ring a bell. Oh, a pointed stick used to make a fence. A fence made of palings. That makes sense. Uh, in 1804, Shelley entered Eton College, a period which he later recalled with loathing. He was subjected to particularly severe mob bullying, uh, which the perpetrators called Shelley Bates. A number of biographers and contemporaries have attributed the bullying to Shelley's aloofness, 
nonconformity and refusal to take part in fagging. Fagging was a traditional practice in British public schools and also at many other boarding schools whereby younger pupils were required to act as personal servants to the eldest boys. Although, um, okay, that makes sense. His peculiarities and violent rages earned him the nickname Mad Shelley. His interest in the occult and science continued and contemporaries described him giving an electric shock to a master, blowing up a tree stump with gunpowder and attempting to raise spirits of occult rituals. In his senior years, Shelley came under the influence of a part-time teacher, Dr. James Lind, who encouraged his interest in the occult and introduced him to liberal and radical authors. Shelley also developed an interest in Plato and the idealist, idealist philosophy which he pursued in later years through self-study. According to Richard Holmes, Shelley, by his leaving year, had gained a reputation as a classical scholar and a tolerant eccentric. Oh, and a tolerated eccentric. Beg my pardon. Um, in his last term at Eton, his first novel, The Strozzi, appeared and he had established a following among his fellow students. Prior to enrolling for University College Oxford in October 1810, Shelley completed original poetry by Victor and Kazir, written with his sister Elizabeth. The verse melodrama The Wandering Jew and the Gothic novel St. Irvin, or the... Rostricrucium Crucian, the Rostricrucian, a romance, published in 1811. At Oxford, Shelley attended few lectures, instead spending long hours reading and conducting scientific experiments in a laboratory he set up in his room. He met a fellow student, Thomas Jefferson Hogg, who became his closest friend. Shelley became increasingly politicised under Hogg's influence, developing strong radical and anti-Christian views. Such views were dangerous in the reactionary political climate prevailing during Britain's war with Napoleonic France, and Shelley's father warned him against Hogg's influence. In the winter of 1810-1811, Shelley published a series of anonymous political poems and tracts, posthumous fragments of Margaret Nicholson, the, necess the Necessity of Atheism, written in collaboration with Hogg, and a poetical essay on the existing state of things, Shelley mailed the necessity of atheism to all the bishops and heads of colleges at Oxford, and he was called to appear before the college's fellows, including the dean, George Rowley. Uh, I may well be mispronouncing that. Rowley, perhaps? Rowley? Anyway, his refusal to answer questions put by college authorities regarding whether or not he authored the pamphlet resulted in his expulsion from Oxford on the 25th of March 1811 along with Hogg. Hearing of his son's expulsion, Shelley's father threatened to cut all contact with Shelley unless he agreed to return home and study under tutors appointed by him. Shelley's refusal to do so led to a falling out with his father. Oh dear. Quite the, uh, quite the extraordinary life so far. Marriage to Harriet Westbrook. In late December 1810, Shelley had met Harriet Westbrook, sorry Harriet, I think I said Harriet before, Harriet Westbrook, a pupil at the same boarding school as Shelley's sisters. They corresponded frequently that winter and also after Shelley had been expelled from Oxford. Shelley expounded his radical ideas on politics, religion and marriage to Harriet and they gradually convinced each other that she was oppressed by her father and at school. Shelley's infatuation with Harriet developed in the months following his expulsion when he was under severe emotional strain due to the conflict with his family. His bitterness over his breakdown, over the breakdown of his romance with his cousin Harriet Grove, and his unfounded belief that he might be suffering from a fatal illness. At the same time, Harriet Westbrook's elder sister, Eliza, to whom Harriet was very close, encouraged the young girl's romance with Shelley. Shelley's correspondence with Harriet intensified in, Ju in July while he was holidaying in Wales, and in response to her urgent pleas for his protection, he returned to London in early August, putting aside his philosophical objections to matrimony. He left with the 16-year-old Harriet for Edinburgh on the 25th of August, 1811, and they were married there on the 28th. Now, this is very, very interesting, because when we were reading Pride and Prejudice, when Lydia and... Um, Oh, what was his name? My memory. Um, Lydia and... Oh, 
Mr. Wickham, that was it, absconded together, uh, the people had initially thought that they were going to Edinburgh to get married. So the fact that, you know, this also appears to have been the um, the real actions of real people in a similar time period, I mean, it would have only been a, a few years apart from when Pride and Prejudice was set, suggests that there may have been a very real reason why people went to Edinburgh. Perhaps marriage laws were different there in some... Um, significant and important way. Hearing of the elopement, Harriet's father, John Westbrook, and Shelley's father, Timothy, cut off the allowances of the bride and groom. Oh, that's interesting. Because I was wondering about how he was going on holiday when um, he'd had a falling out with his father. Yes, because his father had threatened to cut all contact, but apparently cutting all contact, if he did do that at the time, uh, didn't include cutting his allowance. Shelley's father believed his son had married beneath him, as Harriet's father had earned his fortune in trade and was the owner of a tavern and coffee house. Well, the thing is, that... That is a perfectly reasonable, um, a, a perfectly representative uh, example of the views that were held at the time, that the really well-to-do did not um, partake in trade and generally looked down on those who partook in trade, but wasn't... Um, Percy's mother, and therefore Sir Timothy Shelley's wife, the daughter of a successful butcher, yes. So this seems a little uh, hypocritical. Surviving on borrowed money, Shelley and Harriet stayed in Edinburgh for a month with Hogg living under the same roof. The trio left for York in October, and Shelley went on to Sussex to settle matters with his father, leaving Harriet behind with Hogg. Shelley returned from his unsuccessful excursion to find out that Eliza had moved in with Harriet and Hogg. Harriet confessed that Hogg had tried to seduce her while Shelley had been away. Shelley, Harriet and Eliza soon left for Keswick in the Lake District, leaving Hogg in York. Uh, at this time, Shelley was also involved in an intense platonic relationship with Elizabeth Hitchener, a 28-year-old unmarried schoolteacher of advanced views with whom he had been corresponding. Hitchener, whom Shelley called the sister of my soul and my second self, became his confidant and intellectual companion as he developed his views on politics, religion, ethics and personal relationships. Uh, Shelley proposed that she join him, Harriet and Eliza, in the communal household where all property would be shared. Hmm. Uh, the Shelleys and Eliza spent December and January in Keswick, where Shelley visited Robert Southey, whose poetry he, admi he admired. Southey was taken with Shelley, even though there was a wide gulf between them politically, and predicted great things for him as a poet. Southey also informed Shelley that William Godwin, author of Political Justice, which had greatly influenced him in his youth, and which Shelley also admired, was still alive. Shelley wrote to Godwin, Godwin, offering himself as his devoted disciple. Godwin, who had modified many of his earlier radical views, advised Shelley to reconcile with his father, became a scholar before he published anything else, and give up his avowed plans for political agitation in Ireland. Meanwhile, Shelley had met his father's patron, Charles Howard, the 11th Duke of Norfolk, who had helped secure the reinstatement of Shelley's allowance. With Harriet's allowance also restored, Shelley now had the funds for his Irish adventure. Their departure for Ireland was precipitated by increasing hostility towards the Shelley household from their landlord and neighbours who were alarmed by Shelley's scientific experiments, pistol shooting and radical political views. As tension mounted, Shelley claimed he had been attacked in his home by ruffians, an event which might have been real or a delusional episode triggered by stress. This was the first of a series of episodes in subsequent years where Shelley claimed to have been attacked by strangers during periods of personal crisis. Early in 1812, Shelley wrote, published and personally distributed in Dublin three political tracts, an address to the Irish people, proposals for an association of philanthropists, and a declaration of rights. He also delivered a speech at a meeting 
of O'Connell's Catholic Committee in which he called the Catholic Emancipation, repeal of the Act of Union, and an end to the oppression of the Irish poor. Reports of Shelley's sub subversive activities were sent to the Home Secretary. Goodness me. Returning from Ireland, the Shelley household travelled to Wales, then Devon, where they again came under government surveillance for distributing subversive literature. Elizabeth Hitchener joined the household in Devon, but several months later had a falling out with the Shelleys and left. The Shelley household had settled in Tremadog, Wales, which I'm probably mispronouncing, in September 1812, where Shelley worked on a Queen Mab, sorry, on Queen Mab, a utopian allegory with extensive notes preaching atheism, free love, republicanism, and vegetarianism. The poem was published the following year in a private edition of 25, sorry, 250 copies, although few were initially distributed because of the risk of prosecution, of prosecution for sedition and religious libel. In February 1813, Shelley claimed he was attacked in his home at night. The incident might have been real, a hallucination brought on by stress or a hoax staged by Shelley in order to escape government surveillance, creditors and his entanglements in local politics. The Shelleys and Eliza fled to Ireland, then London. Back in England, Shelley's debts mounted as he tried unsuccessfully to reach a financial settlement with his father. On the 23rd of June, Harriet gave birth to a girl, Eliza Ianthe Shelley, which I may be mispronouncing. And in the following months, the relationship between Shelley and his wife deteriorated. Shelley resented the influence of Harriet's sister, the influence Harriet's sister had over her, while, Har while Harriet was alienated by Shelley's close friendship with an attractive widow, Harriet Bionville, and her daughter Cornelia Turner. Following Ianthe's birth, the Shelleys moved frequently across London, Wales, the Lake District, Scotland, and Berkshire to escape creditors and search for a home. In March 1814, Shelley remarried Harriet in London to settle any doubts about the legality of the Edinburgh wedding and secure the rights of their child. Nevertheless, the Shelleys lived apart for most of the following months and Shelley reflected bitterly on my rash and heartless union with Harriet. Elopement with Mary Godwin. In May 1814, Shelley began visiting his mentor, Godwin almost daily and soon fell in love with Mary, the 16 year old daughter of Godwin and the late feminist author. Oh, sorry, the 16, the 16 year old daughter of Godwin and the late feminist author, Marie Wollstonecraft. Shelley and Mary declared their love for each other during a visit to her mother's grave in the churchyard of St. Pancras Old Church on the 26th of June when Shelley told Godwin that he intended to leave. Harriet and live with Mary, his mentor banished him from the house and forbade Mary from seeing him. Shelley and Mary eloped to Europe on uh, the 28th of July, taking Mary's stepsister, Claire Clermont, with them. Before leaving, Shelley had secured a loan of £3,000 but had left most of the funds at the disposal of Godwin and Harriet, who, who was now pregnant. The financial arrangement with Godwin led to rumours that he had sold his daughter to Shelley. Goodness. Shelley, Mary and Claire made their way across war-ravaged France where Shelley wrote to Harriet, asking her to meet them in Switzerland with the money he had left for her. Hearing nothing from Harriet in Switzerland and unable to secure sufficient funds or suitable accommodation, the three travelled to Germany in Holland before returning to England on the 13th of September. Shelley spent the next few months trying to raise loans and avoid bailiffs. Mary was pregnant, lonely, depressed and ill. Her mood was not improved when she heard that, on the 30th of November, Harriet had given birth to Charles Bysshe Shelley, heir to the Shelley fortune and baron, uh, baronetcy. This was followed in early January 1815 by news that Shelley's grandfather, Sir Bysshe, had died leaving an estate worth uh, 2000, sorry, £220,000. The settlement of the estate and a financial settlement between Shelley and his father, now Sir Timothy, However, it was not concluded until April the following year. In February 1815, Mary gave premature birth to a baby girl who died ten days later, deepening her depression. In the following weeks, Mary became close to Hogg, who temporarily moved into the household. She was almost certainly having a sexual relationship with Claire at this time. Uh, and it is possible that Mary, with Shelley's encouragement, was also having a sexual relationship with Hogg. In May, Claire left the household. 
at Mary's insistence to reside in Lynmouth. In August, Shelley and Mary moved to Bishopsgate, where Shelley worked on Alastor, a long poem in blank verse based on the myth of Narcissus and Echo. Um, Alastor was published in an edition of 250 in early 1816 to poll sales and largely unfavorable reviews from the conservative press. On the 24th of January 1816, Mary gave birth to William Shelley. She was delighted to have another son, but was suffering from the strain of prolonged financial negotiations with his father, Harriet and William Godwin. Shelley showed signs of delusional behaviour and was contemplating an escape to the continent. Claire initiated a sexual relationship with Lord Byron in April 1816, just before his self-exile on the continent, and then arranged for Byron to meet Shelley, Mary and her in Geneva. Shelley admired Byron's poetry and had sent him Queen Mab and other poems. Shelley's party arrived in Geneva in May and rented a house close to Villa Diodati on the shores of Lake Geneva where Byron was staying. There Shelley, Byron and the others engaged in discussions about literature, science and various philosophical doctrines. One night, one night while Byron was, was reciting Coleridge's Christabel, Shelley suffered a severe panic attack with hallucinations. The previous night, Mary had had a more productive vision or nightmare which inspired her novel Frankenstein. Shelley and Byron then took a boating tour around Lake Geneva which inspired Shelley to write his Hymn to Intellectual Beauty, his first substantial poem since Al Alastor. A tour of Chamonix, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but I must be, in the French Alps inspired Mont Blanc which had been described as an atheistic response to Coleridge's hymn before the sunrise in the Vale of Chamonix. During this tour, Shelley often signed guest books with a declaration that he was an atheist. These declarations were seen by other British tourists, including Selfie, which hardened attitudes against Shelley back home. Uh, relations between Byron and Shelley's party became strained when Byron was told that Claire was pregnant with his child, uh, Shelley, Mary and Claire left Switzerland in late August with arrangement for the expected ba baby still unclear, although Shelley made provision for Claire and the baby in his will. In January 1817, Claire gave birth to a daughter by Byron, who she named Alba, but later renamed Allegra in accordance with Byron's wishes. Interesting. Uh, marriage to Mary Godwin. Shelley and Mary returned to England in September 1816. And in early October, they heard that Mary's half-sister, Fanny Imlay, had killed herself. Godwin believed that Fanny had been in love with Shelley, and Shelley himself suffered depression and guilt over her death, writing, Friend, had I known thy secret grief, should we had parted so? Further tragedy followed in December, when Shelley's estranged wife, Harriet, drowned herself in the Serpentine. Oh dear. Um... A 40-acre recreational lake in Hyde Park, London. Um, Harriet, pregnant and living alone at the time, believed that she had been abandoned by her new lover. Uh, in her suicide letter, she asked Shelley to take custody of her son Charles, but to leave their daughter in her sister Eliza's care. Shelley married Mary Godwin on the 30th of December, despite his philosophical objection to their institution. The marriage was intended to help secure Shelley's custody of his children by Harriet and to placate Godwin, who had refused to see Shelley and Mary uh, because of their previous adulterous relationship. After a pr prolonged legal battle, the Court of Chancery eventually awarded custody of Shelley and Harriet's children to foster parents on the grounds that Shelley had abandoned his first wife for Mary without cause and was an atheist. In March 1817, the Shelleys moved to the village of Marlow, Buckinghamshire, where Shelley's friend Thomas Love Peacock lived. The Shelley household included Claire and her baby Allegra, both of whose presence was resented by Mary. Uh, Shelley's generosity with money and increasing debts also led to financial and marital stress, as did Godwin's frequent requests for financial help. On the 2nd of September, Mary gave birth to a daughter, Clara Everina Shelley. Soon after, Shelley left for London with Claire, which increased Mary's resentment towards her stepsister. Shelley was arrested for two days in London over money he owed, 
over money he owed and attorneys visited Mary and Marlowe over Shelley's debts. Uh, Shelley took part in the literary and political circle that surrounded Leigh Hunt and during this period he met William Hazlitt and John Keats, uh, whose poetry we have also read. Uh, Shelley's major work during this time was Leone and Synthna, which I may well be mispronouncing, probably am, a long narrative poem featuring incest and attacks on religion. It was hastily withdrawn after publication due to fears of prosecution for a religious libel and was re-edited and reissued as the Revolt of Islam in January 1818. Uh-huh. Religious libel is an interesting one. I, I wasn't familiar with that term. I wonder if that is a term they use to refer to any written material which is contrary to the predominant religious beliefs of the time. Anyway, Shelley also published two political tracts under a pseudonym, a proposal for putting reform to the vote throughout the kingdom, uh, and an address to the people on the death of Princess Charlotte. In December he wrote Osmandius, which is considered to be one of his finest sonnets, as part of a competition with a friend and fellow poet Horace Smith. Um, goodness me. Oh, there's not too much more. Okay. Uh, we'll finish this and then we'll get on with the poetry. On the 12th of March, 1818, the Shelleys and Clare left England to escape its tyrannical civil and religious... I'm not being foolish here, am I? That is indeed what it says. It seems like that's been cut off. T oh, tyranny, civil and religious. Okay, that makes sense. Sorry. Uh, so I'll say that again. On the 12th of March 1818, the Shelleys and Clare left England to escape its tyranny, civil and religious. A doctor had also recommended that Shelley go to Italy for his chronic lung complaint, and Shelley had arranged to take Clare's daughter, Allegra, to her father, Byron, who was now in Venice. After travelling some months through France and Italy, Shelley left Mary and baby uh, Clara, uh, Bagni di Luca, which I'm surely mispronouncing, in today's Tuscany. While he travelled with Claire to Venice to see Byron and make arrangements for visiting Allegra, Byron invited the Shelleys to stay at his summer residence at Este. Again, I'm probably mispronouncing that. And Shelley urged Mary to meet him there. Clara became seriously ill on the journey. Sorry, Clara became seriously ill on the journey and died on the 24th of September in Venice. Following Clara's death, Mary fell into a long period of depression and emotional estrangement from Shelley. The Shelleys moved to Naples on the. 1st of December, where they stayed for three months. During this period, Shelley was ill, depressed and almost suicidal. Um, a state of mind reflected in his poem, Stanzas Written a Dejection, December 1818, near Naples. Oh dear. So both Mary and Percy are uh, going through a deep depression. While in Naples, Shelley registered the birth and baptism of a baby girl, Eleanor, Adelaide Shelley, born 27th of December, naming her himself as the father and falsely naming Mary as the mother. The parentage of Elena uh, has never been conclusively established. Biographers have variously speculated that she was adopted by Shelley to console Mary for the loss of Clara, that she was Shelley's child to Claire, that she was his child to his servant, Elise Foggy, or that she was a child of a mysterious lady who had followed Shelley to the continent. Shelley registered the birth and baptism on the 27th of February 1819, and the household left Naples for Rome the following day, leaving Eleanor with carers. Eleanor was to die in a poor suburb of Naples on the 9th of June 1820. That is tragic. Uh, in Rome, Shelley was in poor health, probably suffering from nephritis and tuberculosis which later was in remission. Nevertheless he made significant progress on three major works Julian and Madalo, Prometheus Unbound, that's where the song was that we had uh, which we read where it was from and the Sensi. Julian and Madalo is an autobiographical poem which explores the relationship between Shelley and Byram and analyzes Shelley's personal crisis of 1818 and 1819 the poem was completed in the summer of 1819, but was not published in Shelley's lifetime. Prometheus Unbound is a long dramatic poem inspired by 
Aeschylus's retelling of the Prometheus myth it was completed in late 1819 and published in 1820. The Sensi, which I'm probably mispronouncing, as with the other um, foreign words, is the first drama of rape, murder, and incest based on the story of the Renaissance Count Sensi of Rome and his daughter Beatrice. Shelley completed the play in September and the first edition was published that year. It was to become one of the most popular works and the only one to have two authorised editions in his lifetime. Hmm. Shelley's three-year-old son, William, died in June, probably of malaria. The new tragedy caused a further decline in Shelley's health and deepened Mary's depression. On the 4th of August, she wrote, We have now lived five years together, and if all the events of the five years were blotted out, I might be happy. The Shelleys were now living in Liverno, which again, probably mispronouncing, where in September, Shelley heard of the peaceful massacre of peaceful protesters in Manchester. Within two weeks, he had completed one of the most one of his most famous political poems, poems, The Mask of Anarchy, and dispatched it to Leigh Hunt for publication. Hunt, however, decided not to publish it for fear of prosecution for seditious libel. Again, another form of libel, which doesn't seem to be um, civil in nature. It doesn't seem to uh, relate to specifically saying, um, spreading false and uh, damaging remarks about an individual. The poem was only officially published in 1832. The Shelleys moved to Florence in October where Shelley read a scathing review of the Revolt of Islam and its earlier version, Laun and Synthna, in the Conservative Quarterly Review. Shelley was angered by the personal attack on him in the article which he erroneously believed had been written by Southey. His bitterness over the review lasted for the rest of his life. Um, oh, I notice that they've got a section here from um, Oge the West Wind, but we're going to read that one next. That's the very next thing we're going to do after um, after we finish this uh, section of the Wikipedia article, so I won't read it now. On the 12th of November, Mary gave birth to a boy, Percy Florence Shelley. Around the time of Percy's birth, the Shelley met Sophia Stacy, who was a ward of one of Shelley's uncles and was staying at the same pension as the Shelley's. Sophia, a, talent, a talented harpist and singer, formed a friendship with Shelley while Mary was preoccupied with a newborn son. Shelley wrote at least five love poems and fragments for Sophia, including song written for an Indian air. Hmm. Sorry, where were they? Um, I'm just wondering why it says an Indian air. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, the Shelleys moved to Pisa in January 1820, ostensibly to consult a doctor who had been recommended to them. There they became friends with an Irish Republican, Margaret Masson, Lady Margaret Manchishell? No, Mount Cashel? I'm not sure, I'm probably, I'm almost certainly mispronouncing that. Uh, and her common law husband, George William Ty. Mrs. Mason became the inspiration for Shelley's poem, The Sensitive Plant, and Shelley's discussions with Mason and Ty influenced his political thought and his critical interest in the population theories of Thomas Malthus. In March, Shelley wrote to friends that Mary was depressed, suicidal and hostile towards him. Shelley was also beset by financial worries, as creditors, as creditors from England pressed him for payment and he was obliged to make secret payments in connection with his uh, Neapolitan charge, Elena. Uh, she had passed on, hadn't she? Hmm. Meanwhile, Shelley was writing a philosophical view of reform, a political essay which, had uh, which he had begun in Rome. The unfinished essay, which remained unpublished in Shelley's lifetime, has been called one of the most advanced and sophisticated documents of political philosophy in the 19th century. Another crisis erupted in June when Shelley claimed that he had been assaulted in the Peace and Post Office by a man accusing him of foul crimes. Shelley's biographer, James Bieri, 
suggests that this incident was possibly a delusional episode brought on by extreme stress, as Shelley was being blackmailed by a former servant, uh, Paolo Foggy, over baby Eleanor. It is likely that the blackmail was connected with a story spread by another former servant, Elise Foggy, that Shelley had fathered a child to Claire in Naples and had sent it to a foundling home. Shelley, Claire and Mary denied this story and Elise later recanted. In July, hearing that John Keats was seriously ill in England, Shelley wrote to the poet inviting him to stay with him at Pisa. Keats replied with the hopes of seeing him, but instead arrangements were made for Keats to travel to Rome. Following the death of Keats in 1821, Shelley wrote Adonis, which Harold Bloom considers one of his major pastoral elegies. The poem was published in Pisa in July 1821, but sold few copies. In early July 20, Shelley heard that baby Eleanor had died on the 9th of June, in the months following the post office incident and Eleanor's death, relations between Mary and Claire deteriorated and Claire spent most of the next two years living separately from the Shellers, mainly in Florence. That December, Shelley met Teresa, Amelia Viviani, who was the 19-year-old daughter of the governor of Pisa and was living in the convent awaiting a suitable marriage. Shelley visited her several times over the next few months and they started a passionate correspondence which dwindled after a marriage the following September. Amelia was the inspiration for Shelley's major poem, Epi... Epipsychidion. Epipsychidion, I think. Um, in March 1821, Shelley completed a defense of poetry, a response to Peacock's article, The Four Ages of Poetry, Shelley's essay, with its famous conclusion, Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Um, it remained unpublished in his lifetime. Shelley went alone to Ravenna in early August to see Byron, making a detour to Laverno for the rendezvous with Claire. Shelley stayed with Byron for two weeks and invited, invited the older poet to spend the winter in Pisa. After Shelley heard Byron read his newly completed fifth canto of Don Juan, he wrote to Mary, I despair of rivaling Byron. So, um, to be clear, because uh, this this um, sentence is um, ambiguously written, it says, after Shelley heard Byron read his newly composed fifth canto, right, who is his? Uh, is that Byron or Shelley? It's Byron, um, as it happens. Uh, he wrote to Mary, I despair of rivaling Byron. So, um, Byron visited, read his, uh, n read part of his new canto, uh, Don Juan and Shelley is uh, somewhat in awe, it would seem. In November, Byron moved into Villa Lan Franchi in Pisa, just across the river from the Shelleys. Byron became the centre of the Pisan circle, which was to include Shelley, Thomas Medwin, Edward Williams and Edward Trello Trelawney. Um, in the early months of 1822, Shelley became increasingly close to Jane Williams, was living with her partner, Edward Williams, in the same building as the Shellers. Shelley wrote a number of love poems for Jane, including The Serpent is Shut Out of Paradise and With a, gutter t uh, and with a Guitar to Jane. Shelley's obvious affection for Jane was to cause increasing tension between Shelley, Edward Williams and Mary. Uh, Claire arrived in Pisa in April at Shelley's invitation, and soon after they heard that her daughter, Allegra, had died of typhus in Ravenna. Uh, the Shelleys and Claire then moved to Villa Magni near Lerici on the shores of the Gulf of La Spezia. Shelley acted as mediator between Claire and Byron over arrangements for the burial of their daughter, and the added strain led to Shelley having a series of hallucinations. Mary almost died from a miscarriage on the 16th of June, her life only being saved by Shelley's effective first aid. Two days later, um, Shelley wrote to a friend that there was no sympathy between Mary and him, and if the past and future could be obliterated, he would be content in his vote with Jane and her guitar. The same day, he wrote to Trelawney asking for prussic acid. The following week, Shelley woke the household with his screaming over her own nightmare or hallucination in which he saw Edward and Jane Williams as walking corpses and himself strangling Mary. During this time, Shelley was writing his final major poem, The, un the Unfinished, The Triumph of Life, which Harold Bloom has called the most despairing poem he wrote. Oh dear. On the 1st of July 1822, Shelley and Edward Williams sailed in Shelley's new boat, 
the Don Juan. Now, oh, so Shelley. Again, it's ambiguously written. Shelley and Edward Williams sailed in. Oh no, it's not. I apologise. Shelley and Edward Williams sailed in Shelley's new boat, the Don Juan. So Shelley has bought a boat and called it Don Juan, presumably after Byron's poem, uh, to Laverno, where Shelley met Lee Hunt and Byron in order to make arrangements for a new journal, the Liberal. After the meeting on the 8th of July, Shelley, William, and their boat boy sailed out of Laverno for Larisi. A few hours later, the, the Don Juan and its inexperienced crew were lost in a storm. Um, the vessel, an open boat, had been custom built in Genoa for Shelley. Mary Shelley declared in her note on poems of 1822 that the design had a defect and that the boat was never seaworthy. In fact, however, the Don Juan, the Don Juan was over, overmasted. The sinking was due to a severe storm and poor seamanship of the three men on board. Uh, Shelley's badly decomposed body washed ashore at uh, Via Reggio ten days later and was identified by Trelawney from the clothing copy of Keats' Lamia in his jacket pocket. On the 16th of August, his body was cremated on a beach near Via Reggio and the ashes were buried in the Protestant cemetery of Rome. The day after the news of his death reached England, the Tory London newspaper The Carrier printed, Shelley, the writer of some infidel poetry, has been drowned. Now he knows whether there is a god or no. Well, that's quite disrespectful, isn't it? Um, Shelley's ashes were reburied in a different plot of the cemetery in 1823. His grave bears the Latin inscription, Cor Cordium, Heart of Hearts, and a few lines of aerial song from Shakespeare's The Tempest. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Uh, Shelley's heart. When Shelley's body was cremated on the beach, his unusually small heart resisted burning, possibly due to calcification from an earlier tubercular infection. Uh, Trelawney gave the scorched heart to Hunt, who preserved it in spirits of wine and refused to hand it over to Mary. He finally relented and the heart was eventually buried either at St. Peter's Church, Bournemouth, or in the Christchurch Priory. Goodness. Anyway. So. As promised, uh, that's a review of who he was. So now we have a much better idea about his political beliefs and the major events of his life. With that said, uh, let's move on to the first reading of Ode to the West Wind. O wild west wind, thou breathe of autumn being, thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeting, yellow and black and pale and hectic red, Pestilence-stricken multitudes, O oh, thou who charioteth to their dark wintry bed, The winged seeds, where they lie cold and low, Each like a corpse within its grave until Thine azure sister of the spring shall blow. Her clarion o'er the dreaming earth and fill, Driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air, With living hues and odours plain and hill, Wild spirit which art moving everywhere, Destroyer and preserver, hear, O oh hear, thou on whose stream, mid the steep sky's commotion, loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed, shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean. Angels of rain and lightning there are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge, like the bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce maenad, even from the dim verge of the horizon to the zenith's height. The locks of the approaching storm, thou dirge of the dying year to which this closing night will be the drone of a vast sepulchre, vaulted with all thy congregated might, or vapours from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire hail will burst, O oh here. Thou who didst waken from his summer dreams, the blue Mediterranean where he lay, lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, beside a pumice island buys bay, and saw and sleep of palaces and towers, quivering within the waves intenser day. 
All overgrown with azure moss and flowers, so sweet the sense faints picturing them, thou. For those path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms, while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean know. Though voice and suddenly grow grey with fear, and tremble and despoil themselves, O oh, here. If I were a dead leaf, thou mightest bear. Sorry. If I were a dead leaf, thou mightest bear. If I were a swift cloud to fly with thee, a wave to paint beneath thy power and share, the impulse of thy strength, only less free than thou, O oh, uncontrollable, if even I were as in my boyhood and could be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven, as then, when to outstrip thy sky speed, scarce seemed a vision, I would never have striven. As thus with thee in prayer and in my sore need, O oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. A heavy weight of hours has changed and bowed, one too like thee, tameless and swift and proud. Make me thy lyre, even as the forest is, what if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumnal tone. Sweet though in sadness be thou spirit fierce, my spirit, that be thou me, impetuous one. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe, like withered leaves to quicken a new birth, and, by the incantation of this verse, scatter as from an unextinguished hearth, ashes and sparks, my words among mankind, breathe through my lips to unawakened earth, the trumpet of a prophecy. O oh, wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. That's interesting. Is that where that expression originally comes from, or is he quoting it? Because, O oh, wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind, sounds Shakespearean to me. Um, but I may just be wrong. No, it, it, I'm mistaken. Um, it is indeed the last line of Ode to the West Wind. It has nothing at all to do with um, Shakespeare, it would seem. Interesting. Uh, quite a complex poem. So we're probably going to have to take this one quite slowly. Now, I've noticed it's got a very interesting rhyming scheme uh, and structure in general. It's separated into um, stanzas of three verses each. But there's a clear A, B, A, B rhyming scheme that even extends across stanzas. So, to... Um, so, to exemplify that, uh, being and fleeing obviously rhyme. Dead is in the middle uh, of those two rhymes. But then the next, the first line of the following stanza rhymes with dead, dead and red, which then means that the final line must also rhyme. So we have a, a A B A B C B C D C and so on. Um, now, this is, um, I do vaguely remember coming across this form before, but I've forgotten what it's called. Assuming I'm even correct. Yes, it's... I think I'm right. It's Terza Rima.
Oh, the one other thing I didn't mention um, is that it will always end with a pair of lines. Um, yeah, um, a pair of lines which should also rhyme with the middle line before I think. Although sepulchre and atmosphere in here don't. Unless that's supposed to be pronounced sepulchre. Uh, where fear here? Doesn't quite rhyme either, does it? Cloud, bowed, proud. That rhymes properly. So yes. Um... Okay, um, so that covers, so it, it's called Terza Rima, and there is a Wikipedia article on it if, you, if one were to choose to read it, but um, that's what it's called. Uh, it has the rhyming structure I specified, apparently um, you, it doesn't specify a specific meter. Um, so, uh, let's have a look at the meter, shall we? Yellow, and black, and pale, and hectic, red. Pestilence, stricken, multitudes, O thou. Who cherry test to their dark wintry bed? Who cherry? I think I mispronounced. Um, I think I put an extra si syllable into cherry test. Who cherry test to their dark wintry bed? Yes, okay. So I think this is iambic pentameter. So I am, so weak, strong, weak, strong, except where you apply a series of um, well recognized exceptions like um, trochaic substitution and pyrrhic substitution in specific places where you're allowed to. Um, and five of them per line. So. That's the rhyming structure and the rhythm covered. The only thing left to cover really is the meaning. Um, so let's go through it slowly. A wild west wind, they'll breathe of autumn's being. Though from those unseen presents the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing. Okay, so this associates a west wind with autumn and gives us some nice poetic imagery. Uh, yellow and black and pale and hectic red, pestilence stricken multitudes, O thou, who charitest to their dark wintry bed. So this seems to be talking about um, how autumn turns to winter. The winged seas where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave, until thine as your sister of the spring shall blow. Okay, so I think thine as your sister of the spring shall blow must be referring to some wind that blows during spring. Um, but it's talking, it's specifically the imagery and content of this stands are talking about winged seeds, so presumably seeds that float and fall to the ground, um, which will then lie there until spring when they'll start growing. Her clarion o'er the dreaming earth and fill, driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air, with living hues and odours plain and hill. Um, I think this is talking about the advancing of spring 
and all the things that occur during spring, such as the um, the sudden appearance of living hues and odours. Wild spirit, which art moving everywhere. Destroyer and preserver, here, oh here. I'm not entirely sure about that stanza. I think it might be just uh, alluding to the creation and destruction cycle of nature. I could be wrong. But uh, personifying it as a wild spirit in a sort of pagan way. That's my best guess. Thou on whose stream mid the steep sky commotion. Sorry. Thou on whose stream mid the steep sky's commotion. Loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed. Shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean. Uh, I don't read much into that besides poetic imagery and the presence of clouds. Angels of rain and lightning there are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge. Like the bright hair uplifting from the head. Okay, there's rain and lightning. Of some fierce maenad, even from the dim verge, of the horizon to the zenith's height, the locks of the approaching storm, thou dirge. Um, a maenad, I believe, is a type of ocean nymph in Greek mythology, because the nymphs were spread into different species. Uh, were the female followers of Dionysus and the most significant uh, members of the Thyasus, the god's retinue. Their name literally translates as raving ones. Okay, I was mistaken then. These presumably aren't nymphs. Uh, often the main ads were portrayed as inspired by Dionysus into a state of ecstatic frenzy for a combination of dancing and intoxication. During his rites, the main ads would dress in fawn skins and carry a uh, Thyrsus, a thick stick wrapped in ivy or vine leaves and tipped with a pine cone. They would uh, weave ivy wreaths around the head to wear a bull helmet in the honour of their god and often handle or wear snakes. Uh, these women were mythologised as mad women who were nurses of Dionysus in Nyssa. Uh, Lysurgus chased the nurses of the frenzied Dionysus through the holy hills of Nyssa and the sacred implements dropped on the ground from the hands of one and all as the murderous Lysurgus struck them down with his ox goad they went into the mountains at night and practiced strange rites anyway um, we could look into what they are more but um, that would uh, probably uh, take a while uh, before we before it led to any greater insight uh, to this poem. Of some fierce maenad, even from the dim verge of the horizon to the zenith's height, the locks of the approaching storm, they'll dirge. No, dirge is a hu funeral song, if I recall correctly. Uh, of the dying year to which this closing night. Ooh, interesting enjambment across stanzas. They'll dirge of the dying year to which this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulchre, vaulted of all they con uh, congregated might. Of vapours from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire and hail will burst, oh here. Oh, there was enjambment between these um, stanzas as well, like the bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce maenad. Angels of rain and lightning. Okay, so I think this is just describing rain and lightning in very poetic terms as being the uh, sign of the death of the year. Hence references to dirges and a vast sepulchre. Uh, thou who didst waken from his summer dreams the blue Mediterranean where he lay, lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, beside a pumice isle in Bayai's Bay, and saw in sleep old palaces and towers quivering within the waves' intenser day. Uh, what is that? It's a word I'm almost certainly mispronouncing.
again, I'm almost certainly mispronouncing this. Uh, Baiae uh, was an ancient Roman town situated on the northwest shore of the Gulf of Naples and now in the commune of Bacali. It was a fashionable resort for centuries in antiquity, particularly towards the end of the Roman Republic, when it was uh, reckoned as a superior to Capri, Pompeii and Herculaneum by wealthy Romans who built villas here from 100 BC to 80. Uh, 500. It was notorious for its hedonistic offerings and the attendant rumours of corruption and scandal. Uh, the lower part of the town became submerged in the sea due to local volcanic brandy seismic activity which raised or lowered the land, and recent underwater archaeology has revealed many of the fine buildings now protected in the submerged archaeological park. Many impressive buildings from the upper town could be seen in the Parco Archaeologico del Termo di Ballet. Beside a pumice isle in, again, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Um, beside a pumice isle in Ballet's Bay, and saw in sleep old palace and towers quivering within the waves' intense day, all overgrown with azure moss and flowers, so sweet the sense faints picturing them. Thou, for whose path the Atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms while far below the sea blooms and the oozy wind which where the sapless foliage of the ocean know they voice and suddenly grow grey with fear and tremble to spoil themselves oh here I don't rightly follow that this um this section. I think it might be creating an analogy between um, summer turning to autumn and the west wind bringing storms and uh, harbinging an end to the year and this place of hedonistic um, activity in the in antiquity uh, ultimately being submerged by the sea I think there may also be a reference to the west wind bringing the waves that ultimately submerged it or part of it anyway uh, but the problem with that is um, that, that that turns if that is what's being referred to here then that's not actually scientifically accurate but to be fair they wouldn't have had the geological knowledge at the time to know differently I suppose that's my best guess anyway if I were a dead leaf thou might, mightest bear if I were a swift cloud to fly with thee a wave to pant beneath thy power and share the impulse of thy strength only less free than thou, O oh, uncontrollable, if even I were as in my boyhood and could be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven, and then when to outstrip thy skyey speed, scarce seemed a vision, I would never have striven, as thus with thee in prayer in my sore need, O oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud, I fall upon the forms of life, I bleed, a heavy weight of ours is chained and bowed, one to like thee, tameless and swift and proud. Okay, this is making more sense. I think the first part is uh, referring to the way that the wind itself will um, power the movement of leaves and clouds and waves. And then it goes into a description of how, therefore, the west wind can make one powerful, but with less personal control over it. Uh, because you are being powered by the external force and then it goes on to talk about the poet's life in very uh, broad strokes referring to the way that like the west wind the poet is tameless, swift and proud but that life has been unkind and they bleed and the, I think the suggestion is that the poet wouldn't have minded giving up some of that control over their life if the west wind had given them the power to not suffer in that way. I think that's what's going on there. 
Make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. What if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumnal tone. Sweet though it in sadness be thou, spirit fierce, my spirit, be thou me, impetuous one. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe, like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. And by the incantation of this verse, scatter as from an unextinguished hearth, ashes and sparks, my words among mankind, breathe from my lips to unawakened earth. The trumpet of a prophecy, O wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. Okay, this is taking an even more interesting turn. If I'm following this still, I think now the author is talking about uh, their own mortality and likening it to that of a... Uh, to the leaves in a forest and the fact that they die away in autumn and then the west wind blows them away. But of course they don't disappear, they get spread about an entire area and then end up uh, decomposing and fertilizing the next generation. And so the idea now is that I think the, the poet is asking the west wind to blow their last thoughts as the poet passes on across the universe to use it to, f to uh, fertilize another intellectual generation. Which is very interesting, um, from a, uh, it's a very interesting way of, uh, a very interesting imagery, and very interesting, um, I can't even think of the word, it's, is really spotting parallels or spotting even that's not quite the right word spotting things which are like each other um, in some way spotting similarities between thoughts the idea of um, dead leaves being spread and then fertilizing another generation and how someone can leave a body of work and pass on and then that body of work can then change the direction of intellectualism in a particular pursuit for in the next generation. That's not an analogy that I think people, most people would quickly make, but it's, it's an interesting one to have spotted. So I think that more or less covers Ode to the West Wind. I will now move on to the final reading before we move on to Frankenstein, the novel we're currently reading through. If you have any more questions about this poem, that could be the poem itself, the, uh, I mean, even something as um, far removed as the context in which it was written, or something like that, if you'd like to discuss it, or anything I've said about the meaning, the rhyme, the rhythm, um, anything like that. Leave a comment in chat, I will look at it after I finish the final reading, uh, and uh, once I've addressed any such points, we'll move on. So, Ode to the West Wind. O wild west wind, thou breathe of autumn's being, thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, yellow and black and pale and hectic red, Pestilent stricken multitudes, O thou who charitest to thy dark wintry bed, the winged seeds where they where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave until thine azure sister of the spring shall blow, a clarion o'er the dreaming earth and fill, driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air, with living hues and odours plain and hill. Wild spirit, which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, hear, O oh hear! Thou on whose stream, mid the steep sky's commotion, loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed, shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean, angels of rain and lightning there are spread, on the blue surface of thine airy surge, like the bright hair uplifted from the head, of some fierce maenad, even from the dim verge, of the horizon to the zenith's height, the locks of the approaching storm thou dirge, 
of the dying year to which this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulchre vaulted of all thy congregated might, or vapours from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire and hail will burst, O here, thou who didst waken from his summer's dreams, the blue Mediterranean where he lay, lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, beside a pumice isle in Bayai's Bay, and saw in steep old palaces and towers quivering within the waves intenser day, all overgrown with azure moss and flowers, so sweet the scent faints, picturing them. Thou for whose path the Atlantic level powers cleave themselves into chasms, while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods with where the sapless foliage of the ocean know. Thy voice and sudden grow grey with fear, and tremble and despoil themselves, O oh, here. If I were a dead leaf whose mightest bear, if I were a swift cloud to fly with thee, a wave to pant beneath thy power and share, the impulse of thy strength only less free than thou, O oh, uncontrollable, if even I were as in my boyhood and could be, the com comrade of thy wanderings over heaven, and then, when to outstrip thy skyey speed, scarce seemed a vision I would never have striven, as thus with thee in prayer in my sore need, O oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud, if I fall upon the thorns of life I bleed, a heavy weight of hours has chained and bowed, one to like thee, tameless and swift and proud. Make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. What if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumnal tone. Sweet though in sadness, be thou spirit fierce. My spirit, be thou me, impetuous one. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. And by the incantation of this, earth, of this verse, scatter as from an unextinguished hearth. Ashes and sparks, my words among mankind, be through my lips to unawakened earth, the trumpet of a prophecy, O wind. If winter comes, can spring be far behind? So, that's the poetry for this week. So back to so um, yes, back to Frankenstein, from Percy Shelley to Mary Shelley. Uh, last week we began reading through Frankenstein, and we had made our way through the first two sections, uh, letter one and letter two. In letter one, we were introduced to the siblings, Mr. Robert Walton and Mrs. Margaret Seville. Uh, Mr. Walton is an explorer who rejoices in the idea of treading a land never before in imprinted on by the human foot, and he speculates that by travelling far north, north he may discover the wondrous power which attracts a compass needle, among other things. We learn details of his past, such as being largely self-educated in his earlier attempts at being a poet. Um, and then, in letter two, Mr. Walton, we learn that Mr. Walton has hired a vessel and is occupied with collecting sailors. He is experiencing loneliness, as he has no acquaintances of like mind to socialise with. We see more evidence of his education having been neglected, he even says so directly. We also learn a bit about his crew's personal history and disposition. Uh, right, so, letter three, to Mrs. Seville, England, uh, July 7th, 17 dash, uh, I just want to check the time between the letters. So the first one was December and you would assume the previous year then we skip ahead three months no three and a half months to March and then the next letter is in July so that's about another three and a half months later my dear sister I wrote a 
few lines in haste to say that I am safe and well advanced in my voyage. This letter will reach England by a merchant man now on its homeward voyage from Archangel. More fortunate than I, who may not see my native land perhaps for many years. I am, however, in good spirits. My men are bold and apparently firm of purpose. Nor do the floating sheets of ice that continually pass us, indicating the dangers of the region towards which we are advancing, appear to dismay them. We have already reached a very high latitude, but it is the height of summer, and although not so warm as in England, the southern gales which blow us steepedly towards those shores which I so ardently desire to attain, breathe a degree of renovating warmth which I had not expected. Oh! Wait, is he going south then, towards the Antarctic? This may just be me misremembering from last week, but I thought he was going north towards the Arctic. He said he's reached a very high latitude. Um, which way does latitude increase? specifies the north-south position of a point on the surface of the Earth for another celestial body. Attitude is given as an angle that ranges from uh, minus 90 degrees at the south to 90 degrees at the north. Yeah, I thought so. And also the reference to St. Petersburg. Um, I mean, that's in Russia, isn't it? So pretty northernly. Yes. And uh, while we're looking, where's Archangel? In the sorry, is a city and the administrative centre of Arkhangelsk Oblast, Russia, uh, which I must be mispronouncing. Um, yeah, so pretty northernly. So yes, he is going north. We have already reached a very high latitude, but it is the height of summer, although not so warm as in England. The southern gales. Which blows speedily towards those chills which I so ardently desire to attain. Oh, the southern gales must be coming from the south, not going south. That makes perfect sense now I actually think about it. Okay. Uh, and that's also why they're so warming, as he claims. It's because they're coming from. Um, it's because they're coming from the south, they're coming from a warmer part of the earth because he's up north. That that makes sense. Okay. No incidents have hitherto befallen us that would make a figure in a letter. One or two stiff gales and the springing of a leak are incidents which experienced navigators scarcely remember to record, and I shall be well content if nothing worse happens to us during our voyage. Adieu, my dear Margaret. Be assured that for my own sake as well as yours, I will not rashly encounter danger. I will be cool, pers persevering, and prudent. But success shall crown my endeavours. Wherefore not? Thus far I have gone, tracing, my sec uh, tracing a secure way over the pathless seas, the very stars themselves being witnesses and testimonies of my triumph. Uh, wherefore, that just means... Why, doesn't it? Yes, therefore would mean... Um, it would indicate a correspondence from one idea to another. It logically follows. So wherefore would be would mean sort of okay. Where where does this logically follow to? 
what is the logical destination of this fort. So yes, wherefore means why. Um, why not still proceed over the untamed yet obedient element? What can stop the determined heart and resolved will of man? My swelling heart involuntarily pours itself out thus, but I must finish. Heaven bless my beloved sister. Most affectionately yours, R.W. What a lovely way to uh, end the letter. Uh, to Mrs. Seville, England. August 5th. Okay. So we were in July. I think we were later in the month of July than we are now in the month of August. That's right. By two days. So... This is only a month later then. Yeah, it would have to be. Sorry, just... Uh, um going through the months in my head, but of course August is after July, because July is named after Julius Caesar, and he added the month of July to the calendar, and then Augustus Caesar did the same thing, um, adding his month after July, so yeah, this is one month later. So strange an incident has happened to us, that I cannot forbear recording it, although it is very probable that you will see me before these papers can come into your possession. Last Monday, July 31st, we were nearly surrounded by ice which closed in the ship on all sides, scarcely leaving the sea room in which she floated. Our situation was somewhat dangerous, especially as we were uh, compassed round by a very thick fog. We accordingly lay to, hoping that some change would take place in the atmosphere and weather. About two o'clock, the mist cleared away and we beheld stretched out in every direction vast and irregular plains of ice which seemed to have no end. Some of my comrades groaned, and my own mind began to grow watchful with anxious thoughts, when a strange sight suddenly attracted our attention, and diverted our solicitude from our own situation. We perceived a low carriage, fitch, a low carriage fixed on a sledge and drawn by dogs passing on towards the north. At the distance of half a mile, a being which was the shape of a man, but apparently of, gigan of gigantic stature, sat in the sledge, and guided the dogs. We watched the rapid progress of the traveller with our skeletons until, with our telescopes, until he was lost among the distant in inequalities of the ice. I wonder what they mean by the distant inequalities. Do they just mean that they were uneven? You know, there were some large bodies of ice, some smaller, and so on. They were irregular. Or does it mean something else? Uh, an unfair, not equal state. Well, that's clear. Um, I don't think uh, that's the uh, the meaning here. A statement that of two quantities, one is specifically less than or greater than another. Again, not what they would have meant. Uh, okay, I will check my physical dictionary to see if uh, it has it can shed any light on this usage of the word inequality. Inequality. What of want of equality in magnitude, quality, rank, circumstances, etc., variableness, or surface irregularity? So yes, that is indeed what it would means. Uh, until he was lost among the distant inequalities of the eyes, the appearance excited our unqualified wonder. We were, as we believe, many hundreds of miles from any land, but this apparition seemed to denote that it was not, in reality, so distant as we had supposed. Shut in, however, by ice, it was impossible to follow his track, which we had observed with the greatest attention. After about two hours after this occurrence, we heard the ground, we heard the ground sea, and before night the ice broke. 
and freed our ship. We heard of the ground sea. What does that mean? Uh, apparently, sea ground means sea bed. I'm not sure if that's what they mean by ground sea. After about two hours after this occurrence, we heard the ground sea, and before night, the ice broke and freed our ship. Uh, we have a lay until the morning, fearing to encounter in the dark those large loose masses which float about after the breaking up of the ice. I profited of this time to rest for a few hours. In the morning, however, as soon as it was light, I went upon deck and found all the sailors busy on one side of the vessel, apparently talking to someone in the sea. It was, in fact, a sledge, like that, like that we had seen before, which had drifted toward us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Only one dog remained alive, but there was a human being within it, whom the sailors were persuading to enter the vessel. He was not, as the other traveller traveller seemed to be, a savage inhabitant of some undiscovered land, but a European. When I appeared on the deck, the master said, Here is our captain. He will not allow you to perish on the open sea. On perceiving me, the stranger addressed me in English, although with a foreign accent. Before I come on board your vessel, said he, you will have the kindness to inform me whither you are bound. You may conceive my astonishment on hearing such a question addressed to me from a man on the brink of destruction and to whom I should have supposed that my vessel would have been a resource which he would not have exchanged for the most precious wealth the earth can afford. I replied, however, that we were on the voyage of discovery towards the northern pole. Upon hearing this, he appeared satisfied and consented to come on board. Um, good God, Margaret, if you had seen the man who thus uh, capitulated for his safety, your surprise would have been boundless. His limbs were nearly frozen, and his body dreadfully emancipated from fatigue and suffering. I never saw a man so in so wretched a condition. He att we attempted to carry him into the cabin, but as soon as he had quitted the fresh air, he fainted. We accordingly brought him back to the deck and restored him to animation by rubbing him with brandy and forcing him to swallow a small quantity. Why would they rub someone with brandy? I mean, I don't think a significant quantity of it would make it into the body. The alcohol, I mean. I suppose it could... Um, it wouldn't freeze readily so if you wanted to make someone wet in a very cold climate that would be a way to do it but why No idea, I had a, a very quick look online. No obvious answer popping out. Why would they do that? I mean, that would that that is legitimately something you might do to disinfect somebody, but I don't see how it's going to warm them up. Or wake them up, indeed. Anyway, and we restored him to animation by rubbing him with brandy and forcing him to swallow a small quantity. As soon as he showed signs of life, we wrapped him up in blankets and placed him near the chimney of the kitchen stove. By slow degrees he recovered and ate a little soup, which was taught him wonderfully. Two days passed in this manner before he was able to speak, and I often feared that his suffering had deprived him of understanding. When he had in some measure recovered, I removed him to my own cabin, and attended on him as much as my duty would, pit, would permit. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness and even madness, but there are moments when, if anyone performs an act of kindness towards him, or does him any the most trifling service, his whole continent is lightened up, as it were, with a beam of benevolence and sweetness that I never saw in equaled. But he is generally melancholy and despairing, and sometimes he gnashes his teeth as if impatient of the weight of woes that oppresses him. When my guest was a little recovered, I had a great trouble to keep off the men 
who wished to ask him a thousand questions, or would not allow him to be tormented by their idle curiosity. In a state of body and mind, his restoration evidently depended upon entire repose. Uh, what do you mean by repose? Is that relaxation? Uh, rest, sleep. Okay, that makes sense. Once, however, the lieutenant asked why he had come so far upon the ice in so strange a vehicle. His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom and replied to seek one who fled from me. And did the man whom you pursued travel in the same fashion? Yes. Then I fancy we have seen him, for the days before we picked you up we saw some dogs drawing a sledge with a man in it across the ice. This aroused the stranger's attention, and he asked a multitude of questions concerning the route which the demon, as he called him, had pursued. Soon after, when he was alone with me, he said, I have doubtless excited your curios curiosity, as well as that of those good people, but you are too considerate to make inquiries. Certainly. It would indeed be very impertinent and inhuman in me to trouble you with my inquisitiveness of mine. With any inquisitiveness of mine. And yet you rescued me from a strange and perilous situation. You have benevolently restored me to life. Soon after he inquired if I thought that the breaking up of the ice had destroyed the other sledge, I replied that I could not answer with any degree of certainty, for the ice had not broken until near midnight, and the traveller might have arrived at a place safely before that time, but of this I could not judge. From the time a new spirit of life animated the decaying frame of the stranger, he manifested the greatest eagerness to be upon the deck to watch for the sledge which had before appeared, but I persuaded him to remain in the cabin, for he is far too weak to sustain the rawness of the atmosphere. I have promised that someone should watch for him and give him instant notice if any new object should appear in sight. Such is my journal of what relates to this strange occurrence up to the present day. The stranger has gradually improved in health, but is very slight. Oh, sorry, is very silent and appears uneasy when anyone except to myself enters his cabin. Yet his manners are so conciliating and gentle that the sailors are all interested in him, although they have had very little communication with him. For my own part, I begin to love him as a brother and his constant and deep grief fills me with sympathy and compassion. He must have been a noble creature in his better days, before even now in Breck so attractive and amiable. Oh, sorry. Being even now in Breck so attractive and amiable. I said in one of my letters, my dear Margaret, that I should find no friend on the wide ocean, yet I found a man who, before his spirit had been broken by misery, I should have been happy to have possessed as the brother of my heart. I shall continue my journal concerning the stranger interval, should I have any fresh incidents to record. Uh, this is August 13th, so this is, what, just over a week later? A week and a day, I think? Yes. My affection for my guest increases every day. He excites at once my admiration and my pity to an astonishing degree. How can I see so noble a creature destroyed by misery? without feeling the most poignant grief. He is so gentle, yet so wise. His mind is so cultivated. When he speaks, although his words are cold with the choicest art, yet they flow with rapidity and unparalleled eloquence. He is now much recovered from his illness and is continually on the deck, apparently watching for the sledge that preceded his own. Yet although unhappy, he is not so utterly occupied by his own misery, but that he interests himself deeply in the projects of others. He has frequently conversed with me on mine, which I have communicated to him without disguise. He entered attentively into all my arguments in favour of my eventual success, and to every minute detail of the measures I had taken to secure it. I was easily led by the sympathy which he evinced. She used the language of my heart to give utterance to the burning ardour of my soul, and to say, with all the fervour that warmed me, how gladly I would sacrifice my fortune, my existence, my every hope to the furtherance of my enterprise. One man's life or death were but a small price to pay for the acquirement of the knowledge which I sought. For the dominion I should acquire and transmit over the elemental foes of our race. As I spoke, a dark gloom spread over my listener's countenance. At first I perceived that he tried to suppress his emotion. He placed his hands before his eyes and my voice quivered and failed me as I beheld tears trickle fast from between his fingers. A groan burst from his heaving breast. I paused. At length he spoke in broken accents. Unhappy man, do you share my madness? 
Have you drank also of the intoxicate, intoxicating draught? Hear me. Let me reveal my tale, and you will dash the cup from your lips. Such words, you may imagine, strongly excited my curiosity. But the paroxysm... Uh, let's look that up. Paroxysm. A random or sudden outburst. An explicit, explosive event during a volcanic eruption. A sudden recurrence of disease such as a seizure or coughing fit. So it's a random or sudden outburst. But the paroxysm of grief that had seized the stranger overcame his weakened powers, and many hours of repose and tranquil conversation were necessary to restore his composure. Having conquered the violence of his feelings, he appeared to despise himself for being the slave of passion, and quelling the dark tyranny of despair, he led me again to converse concerning myself personally. He asked me the history of my earlier years. The tale was quickly told, but it awakened various trains of reflection. I spoke of my desire of finding a friend, of my thirst for a more intimate sympathy with a fellow mind than had ever fallen to my lot, and expressed my conviction that a man could boast of little happiness who did not enjoy the bl this blessing. I agree with you, replied the stranger. We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up. If one wiser, better, dearer than ourselves, such a friend ought to be. Do not lend his aid to uh, perfectionate our weak and faulty natures. Sorry, let me try that again. I agree with you. We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up. If one wiser, better, dearer than ourselves, such a friend ought to be, do not lend his aid to perfection of our weak and faulty natures. Oh, I understand. So, to put it another way, if one wiser, better, dearer than ourselves, as a friend should be, does not lend his aid to perfection at our weak and faulty natures, then we are unfashioned creatures, half made up. Um, I once had a friend, the most noble of human creatures, and I'm entitled therefore to judge respecting friendship. You have hope and the world before you, and have no cause for despair, but I, I've lost everything, and I cannot begin life anew. As he said this, this his countenance became expressive of a calm, settled grief that touched me to the heart. He was silent and presently retired to his cabin. Even broken in spirit as he is, no one can feel more deeply than he does the beauties of nature, the starry sky, the sea and every sight afforded by those wonderful regions seems still to have the power of elevating his soul from earth. Such a man has a double existence. He may suffer misery and be overwhelmed by disappointments, yet, when he has retired into himself, he will be like a celestial spirit that has a halo around him, with whose circle no grief or folly ventures. Will you smile at the enthusiasm I express concerning this divine wanderer? You would not if you saw him. You have been tortured and refined by books and retirement from the world, and you are therefore somewhat fastidious, but this only renders you the more fit to appreciate the extraordinary merits of this wonderful man. Sometimes I have endeavoured to discover what quality it is which he possesses that elevates him so immeasurably above any other person I ever knew. I believe it to be an intuitive discernment, a quick but never failing power of judgement, a penetration into the causes of things unequalled for clearness and precision, add to this a facility of expression and a voice whose varied intonations are soul subduing music. Uh, August 19th. So this is six days later. Yesterday the stranger said to me, you may easily perceive, Captain Walton, that I have suffered great and unparalleled misfortunes. I determined at one time that the memory of those evils should die with me, for you have won me to alter my determination. You seek for knowledge and wisdom, as I once did, and ardently hope that the gratification of your wishes may not be a serpent to sting you, as mine has been. I do not know that the relation of my disasters will be useful to you, yet, when I reflect that you are pursuing the same course, exposing yourself to the same dangers which have rendered me what I am, I imagine that you may deduce an apt moral from my tale, one that may direct you if you succeed in your undertaking, and console you in case of failure. 
prepared to hear of occurrences which are usually deemed marvellous. Were we among the tamest scenes of nature, I might fear to encounter your unbelief, perhaps your ridicule, but many things will appear possible in these wild and mysterious regions which would provoke the laughter of those unacquainted with the ever varied powers of nature. Nor can I doubt but that my tale conveys in its series internal evidence of the truth of the events of which it is composed. I wonder what he means by internal evidence. You may easily imagine that I was much gratified by the offered communication, yet I could not endure that he should renew his grief by a recital of his misfortunes. I felt the greatest eagerness to hear the promised narrative, partly from curiosity and partly from a strong desire to ameliorate his fate. If it were in my power, I express these feelings in my answer. I thank you, he replied, for your sympathy, but it is useless. My fate is nearly fulfilled. I wait before one event, and then I shall repose in peace. I understand your feeling, continued he, perceiving that I wish to interrupt him, but you are mistaken, my friend. If thus you will allow me to name you, nothing can alter my destiny. Listen to my history, and you will perceive how irrevocable it is determined. He then told me that he would commence his narrative the next day when I should be at leisure. This promise drew from me the warmest thanks. I resolved every night, when I am not imperatively occupied by my duties, to record as nearly as possible, in his own words, what he has related during the day. If I should be engaged, I will at least make notes. This manuscript will doubtless afford you the greatest pleasure, but to me, who know him, and who hear it from his own lips, with what interest and sympathy shall I read in, in it some future day? Even now, as I commence my task, his full-toned voice swells in my ears, his lustrous eyes dwell on me with all their melancholy sweetness. I see his thin hand raised in animation, while the lean, lean, sorry, yeah, it's liniments, I think, as in linear, I would guess. Lineament. I see his thin hand raised in animation, while the lineaments of his face are irradiated. Irradiated, sorry. While the lineaments of his face are irradiated by the soul within. Strange and harrowing must be his story. Frightful the storm which embraced the gallant vessel on its course and wrecked it thus. Chapter 1 I am by birth a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. My ancestors had been for many years councillors and, syn and syndics, and my father had filled several public situations with honour and reputation. He was respected by all who knew him, for his integrity and his indefatigable attention to public business. He passed his younger days perpetually occupied by the affairs of his country, a variety of circumstances had prevented his marrying early, nor was it until the decline of his life that he became a husband and the father of a family. As the circumstances of his marriage illustrate his character, I cannot refrain from, from relating them. One of his most intimate friends was a merchant who, from a flourishing state, fell, through numerous mischances, into poverty. This man, whose name was Beaufort, was of a proud and unbending disposition, and could not bear to live in poverty and oblivion in the same country where he had formerly been distinguished for his rank and magnificence. Having paid his debts, therefore, in the most honourable manner, he retreated with his daughter to the town of Lucerne, where he lived unknown and in wretchedness. My father loved Beaufort with the truest friendship, and was deeply grieved by his retreat in these unfortunate circumstances. He bitterly deplored the false pride which led his friend to conduct so little worthy of the affection that united them. Uh, sorry, let me say that again. He bitterly deplored the false pride which led his friend to conduct to a conduct. Yeah, 
He bitterly deplored the false price which led his friend to a conduct, so little worthy of the affection that united them. He lost no time in endeavouring to seek him out, with the hope of persuading him to begin the world again through his credit and assistance. Beaufort had taken effectual measures to conceal himself, and it was ten months before my father discovered his abode. Overjoyed at this discovery, he hastened to the house which was situated in a mean street near the Rousse, which I'm probably mispronouncing. But when he entered, misery and despair alone welcomed him. Beaufort had saved but a very small sum of money from the wreck of his fortunes, but it was sufficient to provide him with sustenance for some months. In the meantime, he had hoped to produce some respectable employment in a merchant's house. The interval was, consequently, spent in inaction. His grief only became more deep and, rank and rankling when he had leisure for reflection, and at length it took so fast a hold of his mind that at the end of three months he lay on a bed of sickness, incapable of any exertion. His daughter attended him with the greatest tenderness, but she saw with despair that their little fund was rapidly decreasing, and that there was no other prospect of support. But Caroline Beaufort possessed a mind of an uncommon mould, and her courage rose to support her in her adversity. She procured plain work, she plated straw, she plaited straw, and by various means contrived to earn a pittance scarcely sufficient to support life. Several months passed in this manner. Her father grew worse. Her time was more entirely occupied in attending him. Her means of, of subsistence systems dis decreased, and in the tenth month her father died in her arms, leaving her an orphan and a beggar. This last blow overcame her, and she knelt by Beaufort's coughing, weeping bitterly when my father entered the, the chamber. He came like a protecting spirit to the poor girl, who committed herself to his care, and after the intern interment of his friend he conducted her to Geneva, and placed her under the protection of her relation. Two years after this event, Caroline became his wife. There was a considerable difference between the ages of my parents, but this circumstance seemed to unite them only closer in bonds of devoted affection. There was a sense of justice in my father's upright mind, which rendered it necessary that he should approve highly to love strongly. Perhaps during former years he had suffered from the late discovered unworthiness of one beloved, and so was disposed to set a greater value on tried worth. There was a show of gratitude and worship in his attachment to my mother, differing wholly from the doting fondness of age. For it was inspired by reverence for her virtues, and her desire to be the means of, in some degree, recompensing her for the sorrow she had endured, but which gave inexpressible grace to his behaviour to her. Everything was made to yield to her wishes and her convenience. He strove to shelter her, as a fair exotic is sheltered by the gardener, from every rougher wind, and to surround her with all that could tend to excite pleasure, pleasurable emotion in her soft and benevolent mind. Her health, and even the tranquillity of her hitherto constant spirit, had been shaken by what she had gone through. During the two years that had elapsed previously to their marriage, my father had gradually re relinquished all his public functions, and immediately after their union they sought the pleasant climate of Italy, and the change of scene and interest attendant on a tour through that land of wonders as a restorative of her weakened frame. From Italy they visited Germany and France. I, their eldest child, was born at Naples, and as an infant accompanied them in their rambles. I remained for several years their only child, much as they were attached to each other, they seemed to draw inexhaustible stores of affection from a very from a very mine of love to to bestow them upon me. My mother's tender caresses and my father's smile of benevolent pleasure while regarding me are my first recollections. I was their plaything and their idol and something better, their child, their innocent and helpless creature, bestowed on them by heaven, whom to bring up to good, and whose future lot in, was in their hands to direct to happiness or misery according as they fulfilled their duties towards me. With this deep consciousness of what they owed towards the being to which they had given life, 
added to the active spirit of tenderness that animated both. It may be imagined that while during every hour of my infant life I received a lesson of patience, of charity and of self-control, I was so guided by a silken cord that all seemed but one train of enjoyment to me. I assume by so guided by a silken cord he means he lived such a privileged and sheltered life, but I could be wrong. For a long time I was their only care. My mother had much desired to have a daughter, but I continued their, their single offspring. When I was about five years old, while making an excursion beyond the frontiers of Italy, they passed a week on the shores of the Lake of Como. Their benevolent disposition often made them enter the cottages of the poor. This, to my mother, was more than a duty. It was a necessity, a passion, remembering what she had suffered and how she had been received, how she had been relieved, for her to act in her, her turn the guardian angel to the afflicted. During one of their walks, a poor cot in the foldings of a veil attracted their notice as being singularly disconsolate. While the number of half-clothed children gathered about it spoke of penury in its worst shape. Penury? Extreme want, poverty, destitution. While the number of half-clothed children gathered about it spoke of Pedner in its worst shape, one day when my father had come by himself to Milan, my mother, accompanied by me, visited this abode. She found a peasant and his wife, hard-working, bent down by care and labour, distributing a scanty meal to five hungry babes. Among these there was, there was one which attracted my mother far above all the rest. She appeared of a different stock. The four others were dark-eyed, hardy little vagrants. This child was thin and very fair. Her hair was the brightest living gold and despite the poverty of her clothing, seemed to set a crown of distinction on her head. Her brow was clear and ample, her blue eyes cloudless, and her lips and the moulding of her face so expressive of sensibility and sweetness, that none could behold her without looking on her as, a, as of a distinct species, as having been heaven-sent, and bearing a celestial stamp in all her features. The peasant woman, perceiving that my mother fixed eyes of wonder and admiration on this lovely girl, eagerly communicated her history. She was not her child, but the daughter of a Milanese nobleman. Her mother was a German and had died on giving her birth. The infant had been placed with those good people to nurse. They were better off then. They had not long been married and their eldest child had just been, was but just born. The father of their child was one of those Italian nursed in the memory of the antique glory of Italy one among the Schiavi Agnor Frementi, who exerted himself to obtain the liberty of his country. He became the victim of its weakness. Whether he had died or still lingered in the dungeons of Austria was not known. His property was confiscated, his child became an orphan and a beggar. She continued with her foster parents and bloomed in their rude abode, fairer than a garden rose among dark-leaved brambles. When my father returned from Milan, he found playing with me in the hall of our villa a child fairer than pictured than a, a child fairer than pictured cherub, a creature who seemed to shed radiance from her looks and whose form and motions were lighter than the chamois of the hills. Chamois. Uh, a short horned goat antelope native to mountainous terrain in southern Europe. Short for chamois leather, soft pliable leather originally made from the skin of chamois. Nowadays the hides of deer, sheep and other species of goat uh, are alternatively used. The traditional colour of chamois leather. An absorbent cloth used for cleaning and polishing, formerly made of chamois leather. A padded insert which protects the groin. Um, Motions were lighter than the chamois of the hills. So presumably that's referring to the uh, goat. The goat antelope.
The, appar the apparition was soon explained. With his permission, my mother prevailed on her rustic guardians to yield their charge to her. They were fond of the sweet orphan. Her presence had seemed a blessing to them. But it would be unfair to her to keep her in poverty and want, when Providence afforded her such powerful protection. They consulted their village priest, and the result was that Elizabeth Lavenza became the inmate of my parents' house. My more than sister, the beautiful and adored companion of all my occupations and my pleasures. Everyone loved Elizabeth. The passionate and almost reverential attachment with which all regarded her became, while I shared it, my pride and my delight. On the evening previous to her being brought to my home, my mother had said playfully, I have a pretty present for my victor. Tomorrow he shall have it. And when on the morrow she presented Elizabeth to me as her promised gift, I, with childish seriousness, interpret her words literally, and looked upon Elizabeth as mine, mine to protect, love, and cherish. All praises bestowed on her are received as made to a pos possession of my own. We called each other familiarly by name of cousin. No word, no expression uh, could body forth the kind of relation in which she stood to me. My more than sister, since till death she was to be mine, uh, since till death she was to be mine only. So, that concludes the, oops, wrong page, that concludes the um, prose section of this stream. So we will move on to riddles. I believe the last riddle that we looked at last week, the final riddle we looked at last week, was uh, 96, uh, which is as follows. When first the world from chaos sprung, and man his great creator sung, the earth's green bosom teemed with fruit, each native appetite to suit. Though bowed beneath its load to the vine, and flowed the bowl with generous wine, though beauty, harmony, and love declared the system from above. The glorious plan was incomplete, and mortals wanted something yet. Yeah, I came that something was supplied. I snatched the wreath from cloistered bride, bade knowledge ope her ample store. That's prob. Wait, does that mean? I think I looked this up last week. Ope is a shortening of open, isn't it? Yes. Sorry. Vague knowledge, opa, ample store, and waft her sweets from shore to shore. The poet's rudely warbled lay, I tempered with my heavenly ray. From monkish self her science drew, and taught mankind whatever she knew. Religion, too, divinest maid, had now her real charms displayed. Not as by superstition drawn, with rack and fire and tear and groan, but mild is mercy in her face for all the virtuous human race. Nor are my precepts singly told, but multiply ten thousand fold. To every party, sect, and age, I mark that whilom did engage the fond pursuits of heroes, kings, of city sacked, and other things, which never without me would be known, but into drear oblivion thrown. Whilom. While. Fair enough. Um, anyway, the solution to that riddle was the printing press, which I somewhat disagree with. Um, in particular, where was it? Where was it? Uh,
Um, yeah, I can't find a single very clear example, but in general, the idea that knowledge uh, wasn't properly open to the human race until the printing press was created, I disagree with. I think the most of the points that are being made here um, could also be made about writing in general, and that perhaps would have made a better solution to this riddle. But I do take the point that um, once the printing press was invented, it uh, it delineated a sudden change in what in what was possible in terms of. Um, in terms of communication as w um, and so it can be underestimated what a big difference it made but anyway while, I, while I'm not completely convinced by this particular riddle that is um, the official solution so let's move on to 97 I am for the rhyme's sake dear madame Almost not quite as old as Adam. And among mortals shall be found, long as the merry world goes round, but heaven to me will be denied, though virtue were herself my guide. To full maturity I grew, but infancy I never knew. I am called a master, yet I have, full off the doom to be a slave. Not honours do myself receive, although all honours I can give. Ladies' good names I from them steal, and so belike in scandal deal. Yet I'm no friend, I think, to railing. But often hide a sinner's failing. Whenever I marry, tis for life, I never yet survived my wife. Uh... Railing. Um... Unfortunately, Wiktioner is not much help. It only comes up with the fence sense. Oh, wait. I should have, of course, been looking at the verb rail. To travel by railway to enclosed with rails or railing to, to range in line to. No, not that one either. Um, let's try my physical dictionary. Oh, rail. Use abusive language. Usually at or against. Or archaic upon. Hence, railer. Railing. Uh, yeah, I'm no friend, I think, to railing, but often hide a sinner's failing. Interesting. Uh, 
Almost not quite so old as Adam. I think that probably means almost but not quite so old as Adam. And among mortals shall be found, long as the merry world goes round. But heaven to me will be denied, though virtual were herself my guide. Full maturity I grew, but infancy I never knew. I'm called a master, yet I have, full off to the doom to be a slave. Not honours do myself receive, although all honours I can give. Ladies good names I from them steal, and so belike in scandal deal. Yet I'm no friend I think to railing, but often hide a sinner's failing. Whenever I marry, tis for life, I never yet survive my wife. Hello Yisha, how are you? Oh, I'm good. It's nice to see you anyway. Though virtue herself, so though virtue were herself my guide, so this is something to do with virtue, and one would assume reputation. Often hide a sinner's failing. survive my wife. So this is something that can in some sense marry. Good names I from them steal, and so belike in scandal deal. Rumours, perhaps, although. That wouldn't figure with all of this. I don't see how virtue would be a rumour's guide. Infancy I never knew. Called a master, yet I have full of the doom to be a slave.
So all honors I can give. Again, that would kind of figure with rumors. I'm wondering if there's a better, a more precise word for it though. That's my best guess anyway. We'll see. So this is 97. Husband. That doesn't make sense. I am, for the rhyme's sakes, dear madame, although not quite as old as Adam, and among mortals shall be found, long as the merry world goes round, but heaven to me will be denied, though virtues were herself my guide. To full mature maturity I grew, but infancy I never knew, and called a master, yet I have, full off the doom to be a slave, nor honour do myself receive, although honours I can give. Ladies' good names I from them steal, and so belike in scandal deal. Yeah, I'm no friend, I think, to railing, but often hide a sinner's failing. Whenever I marry, tis for life, I never yet survive my wife. I suppose this is the institution of being a husband, as opposed to an individual husband. I guess it half makes sense. I mean, things like, and among the mortals shall be found long as the merry world goes round. I mean, that makes sense. But heaven to me will be denied. Oh, but heaven to me will be denied because a marriage is ended at the point of death. It's till death do us part. In, um,. In Christianity, a marriage is effectively annulled at the point of death. So that makes sense. So Virtue were herself my guide. Okay. I suppose. To full maturity I grew, but infancy I never knew. Well, an infant can't be married, so that might be what they're getting at there. I'm called a master, yet I have fell off the doom to be a slave. I think that's a, cur a um, humorous remark about the state of being a husband. Not honours do myself receive, although all honours I can give. I don't follow that. Ladies' good names are still from them, as in their surnames, presumably, and so belike in scandal deal. Well, you might marry to cover up a scandal, yet I'm no friend, I think, to railing, but often hide a sinner's failings. And yes, that would that sounds like it's... Um, um, this seems to be an allusion to marriage, which is... To cover up a scandal. Whenever I marry, tis for life, I never yet survive my l wife. Again, that sort of makes sense. It would not go the institution of being a husband as opposed to. Um, as opposed to an individual husband. So it half makes sense. I'm not entirely convinced by that one though. Uh, 98. When first Columbus left his native shore, in search of worlds to us unknown before, with him I went, and first of all the crew, with pleasure did the charming prospect view. When he returned, I too returned again, yet never was within the realms of Spain, though in all countries, in all climes I've been, yet in fair Europe never was I seen. The beauteous nymph I never do befriend, though on their charms I constantly attend. A court and cabinet I bear great sway, now what I am, ingenious ladies say. Oh, 
cabinet, I bear great sway. curious that it re refers to returning when Columbus did, but was never again seen in Spain. Sorry, was, ne um, was never within Spain. Though in all countries and all climes I've been, yet in fair Europe never was I seen. Just nymph I never do befriend, though on their charms I constantly attend. I don't know. Gonna have to look it up. Let us see. Uh, I'm trying to uh, solve a series of riddles. I'm, um, I'm afraid I'm at the very end of my stream. This is how I always conclude my streams with half an hour of... Sorry, my um, Wednesday streams, my poetry, prose and riddle streams. I conclude them with about half an hour of poetry. Sorry to hear you're tired and exhausted. Um, and no worries about the uh, slow reply. Um, these are riddles 
from the um, 18th century, so they're, sorry, the, I do apologise, the uh, early 19th century. So these are, um, you also have to bear in mind the uh, difference in uh, culture and the difference in what they knew then to what we know now. Um, see, I had a sneaking suspicion it was going to be another one of these riddles where um, it was to do with a letter. Because um, this is a theme. There have been a series of these riddles where the solution is a letter of the alphabet. But the uh, thing that threw me off was... Where it said, when he returned, I too returned again. I don't... That just didn't sound like the solution was going to be a letter of the alphabet. But okay, we know the solution is supposed to be the letter C. So, let's go through it again. When first Columbus left his native shore in search of world to us unknown before, with him I went... Well, C is in the name Columbus. And first of all the crew... Oh, because it's the letter C. Okay, that was a big giveaway that I missed. Um, with pleasure did the charming prospect view. When he returned, I too returned again. Yet never was within the realms of Spain. Oh, the word Spain. I suppose when he returned, I too returned again is just another reference to the fact that the letter C is in the word Columbus, but it's just... The way it's written didn't make me think in those terms. Though in all countries, in all climes I've been, yep, yet in fair Europe never was I seen. Okay, I, I should have realised this is... It threw me off with the way part of it was written, but I probably should have realised. The beauteous nymph I never do befriend, though on their charms I constantly attend. At court and cabinet I bear great sway, now what I am in genius ladies say. Oh yeah, that's another inf interesting thing about this book of riddles. It's written... There's a lot of riddles that seem to indicate that it's... The reader is assumed to be a woman. Which is interesting. Uh, 99. Uh, let's see if I can finish on a... Uh, on a correctly guessed answer. To five uh, compositors I owe my frame. And what is singular when viewed my name? Forwards and backwards will be found. Forwards and backwards will be found the same. So it's a palindrome. When I'm discovered, you will plainly see what the proud peer and peasant soon will be. To five compositors I owe my frame. And what is singular when viewed my name? Forwards and backwards will be found the same. Okay, both these lines. seem to be saying that it's a palindrome. To five compositors I owe my frame. Does that mean it's got five letters? Uh, when I'm discovered you'll plainly see what the proud peer and peasant soon will be. So I'm conjecturing that we're looking for a five letter word which is a palindrome which describes what the proud peer and peasant soon will be. When it says the proud peer and peasant, does it mean the proud peer and the proud peasant, or the proud peer and the peasant?
I mean, one can't help but wonder if it's a reference to death. But it might not be. I'm discovered you will plainly see what the proud parent peasant soon will be. No, gonna have to pass on this one as well. Uh, perhaps I'll do one more. I'll try a hundred as well. Level. Oh, as in, presumably that means brought to the same level. The only thing I can think is if that's a reference to um, pride being a sin. What the proud peer and peasant soon will be. Because why would you have respect for someone that's prideful? Well, that's my best guess anyway. Um, so yeah, we'll do, I'll do one more. Then I'll stop. My face is smooth and wondrous bright. Which... Mostly I keep out of sight. Within my house, how that is made, shall with much brevity be said, composed of timber and with skin, covered with blankets, warm within. Here I lie, snug, unless in anger. I look out, sharp, suspecting danger. For I am a blade of mighty wrath. Whenever provoked, I sally forth. Yet quarrels frequently decide, but never am known to change my side. That ever so much our parties vary. In all disputes my point I carry. Thousands by me are daily fed, as many laid among the dead. I travel into foreign parts, but not in coach conveyed or carts. Ladies for you I often wore, then return my name declare. My face is smooth and wondrous bright, which mostly I keep out of sight. Within my house, how that is made, shall with much brevity be said, composed of timber and with skin, and covered with blankets warm within. So is this some sort of weapon that's housed in something made out of wood, leather, and blankets? Here I lie snug, unless in anger, I look out sharp, suspecting danger. From a blade of mighty wrath, whenever provoked, I sally forth. Yet corals frequently decide, but never am known to change my side. Though ever so much our parties vary, in all disputes my point I carry. Thousands by me are daily fed, as many laid among the dead. 
I travel into foreign parts, but not in coach conveyed or carts. Ladies for you, I often wore, then in return, my name declare. I don't think I'm going to get this one. <laughs> Unfortunately. I suspect there's some context here that I just don't have. I mean, they say covered with blankets, warm within. But if this is an inanimate object, you wouldn't care if it's warm. For I'm a blade of mighty wrath. If we're to take that literally, then it is a blade. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's a dagger. I say a dagger because um, I'd have thought that's more likely to have a cheap, ha a cheap, um, what's it called, uh, sheath. That could be completely wrong. But I could well believe that um, lots of people might have had daggers with wooden sheaths. Let's see. Oh, it's the sword. Oh. That's curious. Because when it said it was a blade, of course, my mind instantly went to the sword, but... Um... There aren't really very many other candidates, are there? A knife or a dagger? Maybe the clue was, I travel into foreign parts, but not in coach conveyed or carts, because it would be carried. That would distinguish it from, say, something like a dagger, which would be a personal defense weapon. Something that people might just generally have on their person if they're worried about being attacked in those days. Okay, fair enough. So, a bit unlucky with the uh, riddles today, but never mind. Um, so, thank you for coming everyone, I hope you enjoyed the stream. I'll be streaming again on Friday, in which I'll be continuing with Return to Monkey Island, which is the Monkey Island game that, is, that was only released on Monday. Um, Friday will probably be more of the same, since I'll be playing that game until completion. Um, Monday I'll also be streaming again, and then next Wednesday it'll be back round to Poetry, Prose and Riddles. Uh, once I have finished Return to Monkey Island, I intend to begin on the third Mist game. That's the plan. Oh, thank you, Yisha. It's, um, it, it genuinely is lovely to see you. Um... And, uh, yeah, I hope to, uh, it'll, it'll be, uh, lovely to, uh, um, see you whenever you can make one of my streams next. So, um, thank you coming, um, everyone that came, and I hope you all have a wonderful night. Good night.